Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of James, the book of James. Lester Roloff, who was a very, very godly and unusual man, preached more from the passage of scripture that we're about to look at, he told me, than any other passage in the Bible. Because he said it was so practical and essential for success in the Christian life. And this morning as we go to it, I want to ask you this simple question as we start. How good a fake are you? How good of a fake? Every one of us on occasion has put on a pretend mask, a fake mask. We come into church pretending to have it together better than we got it together. We come in and sing, I heard an old, old story and acting like our prayer life this morning was just spot on and we didn't pray hardly at all. We come in and we shake hands with each other and say, how you doing? Oh, great, great, great. And yet my time in the word yesterday was negligible except for being in church. And all of a sudden we just get comfortable with a good act. The greatest acts in all the world are not on a Broadway stage. The greatest acts are not on a screen in Hollywood. The greatest acts are in churches where we pretend to have it together better than we do. Now please don't take that as a criticism because I've been guilty of the act on occasion. I'll never forget I was with my wife and we were uh, going to be in a church on a Wednesday evening. And I got caught on a call with a federal judge. And if you've never been on a call with a federal judge, you don't control the call. They control the call. I mean, they got the power to put you in the slammer. And this church had a, a hill in their parking lot, and the church was up on top. And we parked our little motor home at the bottom. And this judge called, and my wife said, Honey, service is going to start in 30 minutes. I said, I know, I know. Well, the judge just kept going on and on. And pretty soon my wife said, Honey, it's going to start in 10 minutes. All the people are pouring in. I said, I know, I know. Pretty soon she said, Honey, they're singing. We're supposed to be in there. I said, I know, I know, I know. Finally, the judge got off at 10 after 7. And I turned to my wife and I said, come on, come on, hurry up. You're making us late. You're making us late. <laughs> now, my wife uh, has some ailments and you had to walk down three little fold-out steps to get up in our camper. And I said, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And then we got to go up this hill. And I said, come on, quicker, quicker. And she said, honey, you, you go on, you go on. I'll, I'll come as quick as... I said, no, 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 it won't look good if I walk in without you. Did you hear that? It won't look good if I walk in without you. Now we got up to the guy at the door, the greeter, and I knew him for many years. And, oh, Brother Gibson, praise God, how you doing? Isn't things great? I just treated my wife like dirt. Now we walked inside and the preacher summoned me up and I went up on the platform. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, now I suppose you want me to help you. After you treated Glorianne so bad. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much what I had in mind. <laughs> See, none of us wants to be called out on our fake. We just sort of want God to not watch it. Boy, up on that platform, the Lord spoke to my heart, and literally, I mean, God said, you got to repent. If you want me to help you, you need to repent. And when I stood up to speak, I said, i got to tell you, I treated my wife horrible coming in here. I treated her poor. If any of you treated your wife that way, I'd have got on your case. But it was me. How good a fake are we? 
Well, God in James gives us three keys to not being a fake. James chapter 1, starting at verse 26. And whenever you read the book of James, remember this was written by the half-brother to the Savior, Jesus Christ. This was written by somebody who grew up with Jesus as a teenager. Can you imagine being in the home with the Son of God as your half-brother? I can in my own mind imagine Mary saying to James, why can't you be like your brother? <laughs> he was perfect. Now here he is a follower of Jesus Christ, chosen by God to give us an eternal book in the Bible. Verse 26 addressed to Christians, if any man among you seem to be religious, boy, underline that in your Bible, there it is. I seem to be religious. I seem to have it all together. God never called you and me to be world-class fakes. He's called us to be real. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now the word vain there is a very powerful word. It was the word for something that was fraudulently useless. Useless. This man's religion is not real. It's a fake. And yet every bit of this is written to Christians. By the way, great Christians. When you read James, it was to the tribes scattered. Look at verse 1. Greeting to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. These people for the faith were under massive persecution. And yet they stood tall. And yet the fact that they stood tall under persecution didn't stop them from pretending. And God says, you want to get real. It starts with you putting a bridle on your tongue. Only two kinds of people in this room this morning, those with bridled tongues and those with unbridled tongues. And God says, I want you to bridle that tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love what a very wonderful preacher said. He said, the minute I open my eyes in the morning before my feet hit the floor, I ask God to bridle my tongue. This will never happen by accident. This is a decision. Well, Brother Gibbs, I'm doing the best I can to get my tongue under control. Well, look at chapter 3, would you? Let's make sure you understand how incredibly dangerous my tongue is, how dangerous your tongue is. Verse 2, for in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Now catch this, people come up to me all the time, Brother Howell, and say, Brother Gibbs, I got this problem, what do I do? And I say, bridle your tongue. They say, no, no, my tongue's not the problem. Yeah, it is. Because if you can bridle your tongue, you can control the whole body. That's not David Gibbs talking, that's God talking. We want to focus on what we think is the problem. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire. Now this is from God to his own children. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And I hope you underline this. And is set on fire of hell. Can you imagine my tongue, your turn, tongue, can be set on fire from the very thing of hell. Wow. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed 
and hath been tamed of mankind. But underline verse 8. I have it highlighted and underlined in my Bible. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Brother Gibbs, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to control my tongue. You're on a losing battle. The God you serve says no man can tame it. Now, I don't know who the nicest lady here is, but I'm going to use Mrs. Willette because I so admire her. What a gracious, gracious lady. I've known her so many years. And like my wife, I owe my whole ministry to my bride. I could never do what I do without her. And Mrs. Willette's such a sweet lady. But she can't control her tongue. The tongue can no man tame. That's why this bridle is so essential. Have you got your tongue bridled this morning? I grew up on farms, and ours were cattle farms, but my grandparents had a lot of horses on their farms. And we would bridle those horses. Let me tell you something about a horse. They don't want to take a bridle because they realize once we get the bridle in their mouth, we have control. They don't. And we would put honey on it and all kinds of things, some sugar, and we'd grip it at the back trying to slip it in. That horse didn't want to lose control. This morning, are you willing to let the Holy Spirit bridle your tongue? Wow. I was in a service and I preached and my precious wife was with me. And uh, when it was done, we're on the way home in the car, going back to the motel. I said, how do you think it went? She said, it went fine. I said, well, what would you think of the message? And there was a pause and she said, honey, uh, that story you told, I was there. I said, yeah, I know. She said, you... Uh, made it sound much better than it was. I said, well, you know. She said, no, I do know. <laughs> she said, the Holy Spirit should have pulled back on the bridle. No wonder Lester Roloff said, this is so practical. Every person in this room is going to speak 35,000 words today. The tongue is going to be in the middle of every one. Something you can't control and neither can I. But by the power of God, we can have our tongues bridled. I tell the story because I made such a fool of myself. I'm not a good morning person. I get up in the morning, but I don't like mornings. I'd much rather stay up till 2, 3 in the morning. But when you got to get up at 3, 4 in the morning, I just have trouble getting my engine started. How many of you, you're like my dear wife? Boy, she's out of bed 5 a.m. How many of you, that's you? Ought to be legal to shoot you, okay? <laughs> I'm on an airplane, a Delta airplane. The flight's going to leave at 5 a.m. And I got on that airplane, and I believe they put a brand new interior in it. And the tiniest little seats I've ever seen. <laughs> and the minute I saw those new seats, I thought, good night. Once I'm in that seat wedged in, I will not need a seat belt. <laughs> Turn this baby upside down, I won't go anywhere. I walked back to my row, and there was a flight attendant there. People are getting on the plane. And I know exactly what I said to that flight attendant. I took my coat off, and I said, those are the most puny seats I've ever seen. I didn't say anything about her. I criticized the seat. Like that, she let me have it in front of all kinds of people. I said, that's the most puny seat I've ever seen. She said, well, you could lose weight, you know. Oh, sweet Alabama. <laughs> Five in the morning and I got the mouth of the South on a Delta flight. That's all it took. 
She said, you could lose weight, you know. I said, you know what, you're right, you could get prettier. I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you are one of the most seriously cosmetically challenged people I've ever met. I said, when you fell out of the tree, you didn't miss a branch on the way down. Now the people around me started clapping. A businessman there got his pen out. He said, say that again, I want to write that down. He said, where'd you get that? I said, I don't know, I think the devil gave it to me. I don't know. She teared up and I said, if you think tears are gonna help, you're dreaming. She walked off. Now I'm putting my coat up overhead and the tracks in my pocket slipped out. They just came out. And I'm putting them back in my pocket. And like that, the Lord said, probably not a good idea to give her one. If you can't control your tongue, this world does not want to hear what you got to say. Plain and simple. I went back up to her and I said, what I did to you, I'd never want somebody to do to my wife. I never want somebody to do it to my daughter. I said, I broke the heart of God. I had slipped the bridle off. Whoa. I said, I am sorry. She said, I've been a Delta flight attendant for 22 years. She said, no one's ever apologized to me. I said, today's the day. I truly owe you an apology. When that bridle is off of your tongue, there's no telling what'll come out. Set on fire of hell. No man can control it. Get that bridle on. I was getting off of the airplane and the captain was standing at the door kind of just saying goodbye to people and that flight attendant standing there. And as I'm walking down the aisle, she pointed at me and she said, the big guy right there, that one, that one. And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. She's gonna get the captain on me. I walked up and the captain shook my hand and he said, I wanna thank you. I said, thank me. He said, yeah. I said, I don't know, did you hear the whole story? He said, yeah, I did. He said, I'm a born again Christian. And he said, I see Christians on our flights all the time who can't control their mouths. They can't control their tongues. And he said, you weren't doing too good, but you landed well. Have you got the bridle on? Now there's something I learned. You bridle a horse, they're forever trying to get it off. They'll rub it on a building, they'll scrape it on a tree, a fence post, anything to get it gone. Don't lose that bridle. Lester Roloff said, I have the ability to bless God and shame God with my tongue. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Look at verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Now please, that doesn't say you go find some widows and some orphans and go visit them. It says visit them in their affliction. Fatherless and widows were the people who couldn't do anything for you. They couldn't own anything. They had no rights. When's the last time you went to help people who couldn't do anything back? And you sought them out on purpose. Visit the fatherless and the widows. Every one of us has this streak in us where we want to do something for somebody who can do something back for us. Brother Willette, you'll want to know him. He can do stuff for you. That's not this. My wife has helped me with this. She said, let's make a list of people who can't do anything back, but we can do for them. We can visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. My dad put in thousands of acres of corn every year. 
and our neighbor was dying, very sick. And they were going to lose everything. And they had nobody to help them. And my dad said, I want you to go with me. We're going to go over there and offer to help the Tates get their crops out. And I said, Dad, we, we, we got our own to take care of. We got thousands of acres to get planted. We, we, we can't mess with that. He said, you better understand something. Visiting the fatherless and the widows is not an option. It's a command. You don't do this just because it comes up. You do it by decision. I said, Dad, Mrs. Tate is the meanest lady I know. She shoots at our dogs with her shotguns. She's cussing at us for no reason. She's not nice. And I said, they can't do anything for us. Look at their farm. It's all run down. He said, I want you to go over there with me. And we're going to ask for the privilege to serve her. <laughs> Immediately, I went to the men that worked for my dad, and I said, my dad wants us to go help the Tates get their crops in. And they said, well, you got to tell your dad. We're, we're inundated. But he had one man there, Earl Meeks. And he said, your dad's trying to teach you a lesson, son. The rest of your life, selfishness is going to pull you to watch out for you and not others. That streak is in every one of us. We went over to see Mrs. Tate. And my dad, we're standing on her doorstep. She, my dad said, tell her why we're here. And I'm thinking to myself, this wasn't my idea, Dad. You ought to tell her. I said, Miss Tate, we want to help get your crops in. She looked at us and she said, why would you do that? My dad said, tell her. Tell her about the God you serve. Do you understand? If we're going to be real, we've got to tame the tongue. And we've got to start serving people who can't do anything back. By design. She said, I, I don't have money for seed or anything. His illness the last 10 years has taken everything. He's dying. My dad says, tell her we'll do it. Yeah, but my equipment's all broke down. Tell her we'll use our equipment. And then my dad says, tell her it will be our privilege. Be careful you don't get this thing. Well, I'm going to do this for you, but you better appreciate it. He said, you understand the privilege is ours to serve you. She said, I don't know what to say. I stood there and I thought, I don't either. <laughs> When we walked away, my dad said, if you're not careful, you're going to grow up selfish, privileged and selfish. Because you're not desperate for somebody to help you. But the world's full of widows and orphans who need you. When we planted corn and did all that, we worked six days a week. Only shut everything down on Sunday. And when I mean six days a week, I mean 24 hours a day. Those machines were humming. And here we are out doing that. I just kept thinking, I hope she appreciates this. And my dad would show up in the middle of the night, two, three in the morning. He'd say, I can tell the look on your face. You still haven't got it. What's it going to take for us to understand it's a privilege to serve? A privilege. 
When it was all done, we got the crops all in. We got theirs in. We took her the check for all the crops. And she said, well, what part of this is yours? My dad said, we've already been paid. Just getting to serve you is riches for us. That's right. Mr. Tate miraculously didn't die. He lingered at death's door another year, but then recovered. And we got a call one day and said, could we go to church with you? And we went to church with the Tates. First time they went, they both got saved. Widows and orphans in a bridal tongue. Look at the last thing he says. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Devil's got one job today and that's to spot me up. He wants to spot you up. He wants you to get comfortable with sin, with something that maybe only you and God know about. But God knows about it. Maybe it's in the thought life. Maybe it's in your emotions. Maybe it's in something God's laid on your heart and you're saying no to. I don't know. But the devil wants to spot me. I'm a pen guy. I love pens. I just enjoy them. And I have some wonderful ink pens, and the problem with an ink pen is that ink always wants on my shirt. And I have some wonderful shirts that have got ink blobs right on them. And if I wore that shirt, you'd say, you, you, you can't use that shirt. Look at that spot. You'd be right. We're sitting here saying, use me. Use me. And the devil's got you spotted. and to keep himself unspotted. God, no one can do this for you but you, and I'm done. That's why it says keep himself unspotted. How many times I've gone to the altar, not to get clean, just cleaner. Did you hear me? Not to get clean, cleaner. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, what's the next word? All unrighteousness. If I'm spotted this morning, it's by my choice. Because God says, I want to clean you, David. I want you unspotted. D.L. Moody used to close almost all of his services by saying, don't you leave here if you got unconfessed sin. Because you're going nowhere with God. Keep himself unspotted. Wow. When my dad passed away, went to be with the Lord, all kinds of people showed up. The Tates showed up. <laughs> they came all the way from Ohio to Florida. And here was this elderly couple I hadn't seen for the longest time. And Mrs. Tate came up by me. She said, your dad had something. He had something. Make sure you get it, David. A bridal tongue. Visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And keep yourself unspotted. Now, how many of you have children? Hold your hand up, would you? How many of you figured out kids are God's little spies? How many of you know that? <laughs> 
You want to find out about the real David Gibbs? You don't see him on a platform. You see him in a home. You see him in a car. They know the real me. And God knows the real me. This morning I beg you, don't seem to be religious. Bow your heads in prayer. Father, your word is so clear. By your grace, by your power, we want to be everything you've called us to be. Heads are bowed. How many of you say this morning, God spoke to my heart, Brother Gibbs? God helping me, I want that passage to do something in me. Hold your hand up if that's true. Father, you see our hands. More importantly, you see our hearts. A bridal tongue, Father, you've commanded it. It's not an option. In visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and then being clean. What a privilege. Everything you command, you enable. We can be all of this. And we can't control our tongue. The Bible says no man can. But by the power of your Holy Spirit, we can be bridled. Hear the cry of every heart. May that bridle go on right now. May the purpose to serve the fatherless and the widows be put in place right now. And by your grace, we don't want to be cleaner. We want to be clean. Hear our cry in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's children together said, Amen. My wife has helped me on this so much. Brother, we'll let you know my bride. Uh, I married way over my head. How many of you men married way over your head? Hold your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, you have a serious case of the stupids, okay? <laughs> oh, I married a great lady. But she says, honey, you're so busy. that taking the time to find somebody who can't do anything. On purpose, find them and serve them. So let's make a list. Visit them in their affliction. Now it's your choice.